you have your Bibles or your devices, go ahead, take them out and turn to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, chapter 4. And I think I'm probably throwing you all for a loop this morning because we have been, or you may not even remember, but we've been working through the book of Acts quite a bit. And um, I'm going in a little different direction today. So we're going to go to the book of Matthew. And so most of you know, I know, well, I don't know if you know, a lot of people were out last week because it was a holiday weekend. And Pastor Christian filled in. I haven't listened to the message. I know it's up online, and I just have not had the opportunity to listen to it yet. But I know, I'm confident, and I know that he did an amazing job because he is always led and anointed by the Holy Spirit. And so, um, so with that being said, we were out also last weekend, and we were in North Carolina. If, if you ever wonder where we're, out, where we're at when we're out, we're always in North Carolina. We're trying to bring that property along, and God has been gracious. This time we got some plumbing done. Well, we got all the plumbing done. And we got windows ordered, so that's good. That's very good. But the nice part was we had some of our kids with us this last time, three of our four, because Pastor Christian was here preaching. So the other three and the grandkids, some of the grandkids were with us, and, um, and we enjoyed time with them. It was good. But after a week of grandkids, it's like, okay. <laughs> no, it was good. It was really good. But we're fortunate enough, we're not on a river up there, the property isn't, but we're close enough to a river that we were able to go um, and spend some time down there. They have like a little bank that you can sit at, and, and our sons, two of our sons fished and caught a few fishes. And I say all that to say that, um, I'm, you know, I'm not just telling you and rambling about our life, but I tell you that story today because today's message is also about catching fish. <laughs> Jesus uses a real-life activity to teach us a spiritual truth. I love that. When you read his word, he uses real-life situations, real-life activities to teach us spiritual truths. He did that then, and it applies to us today. So as we turn to Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 18 and 19, we're going to see what Jesus talks about when he talks about fishing. So here we go. Verse 18 starts this way. It says, One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called them out and said, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Let's pray over God's word. Lord, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for your living examples to us. It just comes alive inside of our mind as you paint these beautiful pictures. And Lord, I pray that you would take your word today and that you would teach us what you want us to learn about evangelism and about fishing for people. So bless your word. I pray your anointing is on it and that your words come through, not mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, again, we are um, in the third quarter of the year. We're talking about evangelism. We really only have one message left on evangelism because the last Sunday of this month is our missions emphasis week, and we're going to have some missionaries in here. So we're excited about that. I know that wasn't on the announcements, but that's coming up just in a few short weeks. So be praying and thinking about missions. That's why we've got the flags and all the missions posters hung up around here. You know, it's about evangelism, not just here in our hometown, but around the world. It's about spreading the good news of Jesus to everyone who will listen, right? And so Jesus set that example for us. He was the first evangelist. And then he taught his disciples how to evangelize. And now we learn from the disciples what we should do when it comes to evangelism. And in this story, in this passage, passage of Scripture, these two verses that we just read, Jesus is calling 
two of the disciples at that time, Peter and Andrew, the two brothers, they fished for a living. And he said, now, come and follow me. And now I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to show you how to fish for people. So today's title is Fishing. Evangelize. Fishing. We are supposed to fish for people. (laughs) When we're followers of Jesus, he intends for us to fish for other people. And I know that doesn't sound very (laughs) appetizing or, you know, it doesn't sound like fun. I'm going to throw out the reel and, you know, try to catch people. But it's setting a picture in our mind of how to go out and bring people in. Andrew and Peter understood that fact. They were fishermen. They understood what it was to go out and make a living. You had to catch things, or you you weren't going to live. You weren't going to survive. And so now Jesus is turning the tide and saying, now you're going you're gonna to fish for people. And we're supposed to fish for people. We're supposed to intentionally set out to catch people to cast out the net of salvation and lure them in. My grandson loved digging. He's 10 years old, and he was digging for worms as he was digging a ditch for plumbing, for the pipe. He would find worms, and he would get so excited. He and our son Dustin would go and take those worms and put it in a a, bucket. Gatorade, empty Gatorade bottle, so that they could go down and fish for real fish. (laughs) And it's the same with us. we got to get excited about fishing for people, for bringing them in, for casting out that net and that um, line of salvation. You see, if Jesus went to all the trouble of coming to the earth and sacrificing himself so that he could offer salvation to the whole world, then what good would it be if if he kept that news to himself? What good would it have been if he just died for those 12 disciples? He died for all. He died for all. And so he needs that news spread, that good news spread around the whole world world, around the whole earth. And how else will it be spread if his own disciples don't do the work? We are also his disciples, right? We can read the story of what took place over 2,000 years ago and see what he told his disciples. Listen, read what he told his disciples and say, well, that was good for them. Well, no, It applies to us. That's why the Bible, the Word of God, is still around, because it's still applicable to us. Even though they did it, they were the example that we need to follow. Jesus is that ultimate example we need to follow, but the disciples are also examples that we follow. And so Jesus worded it as fishing for people. He said to his disciples, I will show you how to fish for people. I love that. I zeroed in on the words, show you. I will show you. I know that's not in every version, but that was in my New Living Translation version. And I love that. I will show you. How did Jesus show his disciples how to fish for people? Well, he modeled it. Look at his whole life. Three and a half years he spent with his disciples, and they watched every move that he made. And then they replicated it after he was gone. How did he model it? Well, he went to where the people were. We read the stories. He traveled from town to town. He went to where the people were. He loved on people, right? He spoke truth in love. Sometimes it was hard truth, but he always did it in love. He pointed to a better way. He referred back to Scripture that they already knew, and he taught them. He laid hands on and prayed for people. He did miracles and wonders. And basically, he lived what he taught. 
That's how he modeled to the disciples how to fish for people. He put his words into action. And after he was gone, the disciples copied and applied what they saw Jesus say and do. That's what fishing for people looks like. When I tell you that you need to go fish for people, it sounds like an overwhelming task. How am I going to go? Do I need to go out and just tie them up and bring them in? (laughs) No, we need to do what Jesus did. That's what the disciples saw. That's what they did. They applied it to their own lives. You see, when we fish for people and bring them in to God, into the church, into God's kingdom, we're doing it for God's kingdom, for his glory, not for our own. And when I thought about this as I was writing this message yesterday, I thought, You know, let's look around at today's Christian culture. In a lot of ways, I'm not really proud of it. I don't know how you feel about it. You know, and I'm saying, uh, I'm painting with a broad brush here. And I'm looking at today's American Christian culture. And I started questioning, are they fishing? Are we fishing for people? (laughs) What does it look like for the church as a whole today? Is the church preaching and teaching repentance and salvation through Jesus? Because that's, that's what it's about. When we fish for people, it's, it's for God's kingdom, not our own. And so if it's for God's kingdom, then we need to be teaching and preaching repentance, forgiveness from Jesus, and salvation. Through Jesus and him alone. That's what it should look like. But oftentimes when I look at today's Christian culture, I see people recruiting others just to fill their buildings, (laughs) just to listen to their worship concerts, and just to work their social programs that are going on. And it grieves me. It grieves me that today's church, and I, and I want to stop on, on this because I don't want to paint an ugly picture, because there are a lot of churches, there are a lot of ministers, there are a lot of lay people that are in it for the right reason, and they're out fishing for people for the right reason, to point them to Jesus, not to themselves. But sometimes we see these larger organizations, these And I'll call them an organization because they're not really a church if they're not pointing people to Jesus. If they're only pointing people to themselves and trying to build and fill their buildings, then that's not fishing for people for the right reason. See, the goal, the end goal, and the motivation should always be Jesus and eternity. Not ourselves. Not the here and now, and the comfort that we live in now. It's Jesus. See, I keep saying it over and over and over again, but Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back soon, and he's coming back for a church (laughs) that is pure and holy and spotless, that are in it for the right reasons, because they want to spend eternity with him not just to fill their needs for right now. And so that's what we have to really focus on. We're fishing for people. Yes, I would love to see this building full and overflowing, but not for me, not to just gain a name for Genesis Church, but because all of these people would be going to heaven. They would be spending eternity with Jesus. That's the end goal, right? Right. So that's why we tell others about Genesis. That's why we tell others about Jesus. Because Jesus gave his life for us and for them. So what does fishing for people look like for you personally? Do you see yourself as a disciple of Jesus? A devout follower? Are you feeling challenged 
and propelled to go fishing for the lost and the broken. If you're not, then you have to ask yourself why. Why? This whole series, I know, you know, I'm really trying to drill this point home, not for myself, but the Lord gave me this word for this quarter. He gave me the word for every quarter, and each one I've watched, it has built on the other. We're, we needed to grow. We needed to commit. Now we need to evangelize. And the last quarter is praise. We need to praise and thank him for all that he has done and is doing in our life and in our church. But it I think the Lord is trying to drill this home. He's saying the time is short. I'm coming back before you know it. Look up. His word says, look up. Look to the eastern sky. I'm going to be here in the twinkling of an eye. Who are you bringing with you? That's the only thing we can take into eternity with us is souls, right? And we have to evangelize to take souls with us. Don't let that word scare you. Don't let that concept overwhelm you. First, and, and these, these small groups are playing into this also. We have to know who we are in Christ before we can really share the truth with others. When we are confident in who we are in Christ, it took me a long time to figure that out. Who am I? I was insecure. I was very insecure. I was not confident, not arrogant, but I wasn't confident in who I was in Christ because I really, for a long time, didn't believe that he truly loved me and accepted me. And when I did, everything shifted and changed. When I understood that I am a child of the king, I am a child of God, he died for me. He gave his very life for me because he loves me that much, because he wants me to be in eternity with him forever and ever. Once I understood that, that it wasn't about my outward appearance, wasn't about my personality or lack of, it wasn't about my sense of humor, it was just about me. He loves me so much. Everything changed. I understood and I understand now who I am in him. It's nothing in my own ability. It's all in what he does in me and through me. Once you get a hold of that, you can't help but tell others. Do you know who you are? You're a child of God. He loves you. He died for you. He has a purpose and a plan for you. And if you dig in deep, if you dive in, if you... If you just, you know, sit up onto his lap and let him speak to you, your life will be changed. You'll understand. You'll gain that confidence in Christ. And you'll just want to bring others along for the ride. And so to do that, we have to go where the people are, right? We can't just expect them to come to us in this building. We're hidden back in a neighborhood. Unless you live in Highland City, most people don't know. Even those in Highland City don't know we're here. (laughs) Used to be that churches were community churches. Everybody in the community went to that church, right, down the street. That's not so much anymore. People drive and they travel. And they look for churches that have the best programs. And just offer all the things that, that are good for them. And I'm rambling. But we have to go where the people are. We have to love on them. We have to speak truth in love. We have to point to a better way. You know, I have a friend. Nat and I have a friend. Have You know, we do have a friend, believe it or not. Um, (laughs) What'd you say? Just two? Yeah. We have this (laughs) guy. We have this couple, and they are an amazing couple. We've been friends with them a long time. They go to another church, and um, they love the Lord. But her name's Kathy. She really has been battling a lot. She's battled cancer in the past, but she's been battling problems with her back, so much so that, it, you know, she needed surgery. And, of course, our medical system, the way it is now, they just you have to jump through all the hoops 
And so they just kept putting her off and putting her off. Well, she got so bad right before we left to go to North Carolina that she ended up in the hospital (coughs) because the pain was excruciating. And they said they were going to do surgery, but they hadn't given her a date yet. And so um, she hadn't slept in days. They put her in the hospital, and he called us, literally crying, please pray for Kathy. She can't eat. She can't sleep. And I hate seeing her like this. And they've got, even on pain medicine, we don't know what they're going to do, what, what we're going to do. And so we left town just really praying for Kathy. While we were gone, they did surgery on her. Praise God. And so as we were driving back on Friday, we called him. And, and he's like, you can't believe what the Lord has done. She's she has to stay in the hospital for so many days, and she's got to go to rehab for six weeks. But she's not in pain. She's up and walking with a walker. And then he went on to share with us how many God moments they've had in the hospital, how many different people that he's been able to minister to. He was just walking down the hall, and a man, it's 3 in the morning, and the man was awake in another room, and he yelled out to our friend Daryl and said, Hey, <laughs> Daryl poked in his head in, what's going on? And he's like, I'm just awake, and I had this surgery. And he started telling Daryl all about the surgery he had. Daryl's like, can I pray for you? Yeah. They had camp meeting right there in this man's room. How Kathy's roommate works for the hospital, but she was in there and had to have surgery, two surgeries, and how they prayed for her and how the Holy Spirit came down. And the next day when her family came in, they came over to Kathy and said, can we pray for you? And they had another prayer meeting. They were believers. And I say all that to say that God uses every situation in our life, every circumstance, every circumstance, to show us that he's real and he's there and to reveal his glory. But we have to be open to it. You see, we live in a world now where we're afraid to say anything to anybody else. I, I know I am sometimes. I go out in public and I just put my head down and I get what I need to get and I go to the cashier and I don't want to say anything because I might offend somebody or if I wear a Christian shirt, they, you know... I mean, you're afraid to say anything because you don't know how others are going to respond. But here's the truth. (laughs) People are desperate right now. They're looking for hope. They're grasping at anything. And we have the answer. We have the answer. We can't worry about offending somebody else or somebody criticizing us or putting us down or bullying us on social media. We have the answer, and we need to stand in that confidence and say, look, I know that you think this, but let me tell you something else. Jesus loves you, and he cares about you, and he knows what you're walking through, and can I pray for you? And not just say it, but do it right then and there. Don't get so focused in on your own circumstance that you don't see beyond that. Daryl didn't have to focus on anybody else, Daryl and Kathy, but they saw beyond. And God used it in a mighty way. So we need to model and copy the same behavior that Jesus and disciples did. Pray for people. Believe for signs and miracles. Live what we teach. Live what we speak. We need to fish for people. And then what happens? Point number two, what happens after we catch them? See, this is a part that we oftentimes forget. (laughs) What happens after we catch them and bring them in? You see, our responsibility doesn't stop once we lead someone to Christ or once we bring them to church. I know, yes, I told you that it was a 16, another 16-year-old girl who brought me to church with her. She didn't personally lead me to Christ, but she brought me to church. And how grateful I am for that. But here was the problem. I had a lot of questions afterwards. And I was too embarrassed and afraid to ask 
any questions. And she didn't answer any. I mean, I did finally ask her one time about speaking in tongues because I didn't know what was going on (laughs) in the church. I had no idea. I really thought that these people were from another country and they were just speaking their language. I had no clue what it all meant. But that was the only time I asked a question, and she never offered any other advice or direction or discipleship. And unfortunately, that went on for a lot of years. And I, I could have given up and just walked away, but I didn't. I dug in, and the Holy Spirit taught me so much. And there were a few people here and there, but most of the time, I say I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have someone that took an interest in my life and discipled me. And that's a sad truth. That's just sad to say. And so I love discipleship because I didn't feel like I received it the way I wanted it. I now want to give it to others because there's got to be others that feel the same way that I do. And so our job as Christians, as believers, as disciples is to disciple others. Have you ever known someone who gave their life to Christ and then fell away because no one took the time to disciple them, to teach them, and to pour into them? Whose responsibility is it? Most people will say, well, it's the pastor's responsibility. It's the leader's responsibility. No, it's all of ours. It's all of ours. Most of the time, people walk away because no one took an active interest in them, an active interest, more than just saying, hi, how are you? Good to see you at church today. There's nothing wrong with saying that. That's good. But we need to take an active interest in other people, in their walk with Christ. We need to spend the time needed to mentor them and instruct them, whether they're a child or an adult. We all have a part to play in this process in discipling, in encouraging, in uplifting and challenging others in the body of Christ. And if you turn to John chapter 21, John chapter 21, the Lord, as I was praying while we were gone last week, I was really praying, okay, Lord, I'm like evangelized out. (laughs) I have preached on this for so many weeks. What more can I say? And he spoke to me, John Chapter 21. We're going to read verses 15 through 17. It says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then Jesus said, Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said, then feed my sheep. That's what the Lord kept speaking to me when I was praying about writing this message, feed my sheep. And oftentimes we read this portion of scripture and we think, well, that's just the pastor's job. (laughs) Feed the sheep. Yes, we are the shepherd. But it goes beyond just the pastor. We're all disciples. You see, Peter, out of all the disciples, Peter was the one Jesus chose to kind of be the leader, the one to start the first century church, to be that example. And at this, in this scenario, Jesus had already been crucified and resurrected. This was the resurrected Jesus. He walked the earth for 40 days. And he met with the disciples a number of times, and this was one of them. And he met with them to give them instructions on what to do after he was gone. Because now the new covenant was in place, and the church was being birthed. The first century church was being birthed. And he needed to give them complete 
specific instructions on how to do this after he's gone. The Holy, he said the Holy Spirit's going to be with you and he's going to lead you and he's going to guide you and he's going to speak to you and speak through you. But three times he told him, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. See, in the first one, if you, if you really look at it, the first one says, he said, feed my lambs. Jesus was literally saying, when you look up the word feed in that, in that verse, it literally means to promote the spiritual welfare of the lambs. The lambs were the little ones, the young ones. Whether in age or maturity, feed them. Promote their spiritual well-being, their spiritual welfare. So he was telling Peter and ultimately telling us to look after and feed the new ones in Christ. Right? Those who give their life to Christ. Feed them. Teach them. Disciple them. If I were to give you a newborn baby and ask you to care for for him or her, what would you do? Most of the men would say, well, I'd pass it off to my wife. <laughs> but here's the thing. If, I, if there was no one else and I was to give you a newborn baby, what would you do? Well, you would look after their well-being. You would make sure that they were fed. You would change their diapers. You would clothe them. You would rock the baby to sleep. You would make sure that their every need was taken care of until I returned. And as their parent, I would hold you fully responsible for my newborn baby. I'd be upset if you neglected that baby or passed that baby off to someone else. Right? The Lord is holding you and I responsible for newborn believers. What are we doing with them? Are we looking after them? Are we caring for them? Are we feeding them? Are we changing their diapers? Not literally. But are we looking out for their spiritual well-being? That's the point that Jesus was making in that first, feed my lambs. The second, the second version, he says, feed my sheep to Peter. And what he was saying that in that verse, that word feed there means to take care of. Take care of my sheep, to tend to, to nourish, to cherish, to serve, to supply, I love this one, to supply for the soul's need. That's what that feed. See, it's a different word each time. That feed means to care or supply for the soul's need. Hmm. So, again, Jesus is telling Peter and ultimately us that even the older believers are in need of care, too. The sheep. First it was the lamb. Now he's moved up to the sheep. Take care of them. Nourish them. Serve them. Tend to them. Supply for their soul's need. doesn't matter what age others are or how long they've served the Lord. All, all are in need of spiritual nourishment and care. That's why you're here today, right? We're all in need of spiritual nourishment and care. What are you doing to nourish others? Or to serve others? Or to cherish others? Or to supply for their soul's needs? None of us have ever and will ever fully arrive on this side of eternity to where we don't need to give and receive spiritual nourishment. We need to give it. We need to receive it. If you think you've attained, you are mistaken. (laughs) Because we can all continue to learn and grow. If all will do their part, then all will benefit. I don't ever want anyone to think that you just come to church to just sit and receive. We're responsible to give and to nourish others and to tend to others. The third statement from Jesus, again, he says to Peter, feed my sheep. And this feed 
goes back to the first meaning of promoting spiritual welfare. So first, he said to Peter, nurture and train the little lambs. Then he says, take care of the older ones, the sheep. Then he goes back to nurture and care for the sheep also. So he covered all the bases. Covered all the bases, the young ones, the old ones. Feed them, nurture them, nourish them, tend to them, serve them. If Jesus told Peter three times to care for the flock, which is the body, it would appear to me that he places a high value on the practice of pouring into others, right? So we need to fish for people. But then once we catch them, we need to nourish them. We need to care for them. Jesus, when you talk to to Peter in these verses, he equated love for him with feeding. If you love me, Peter, if you love me, then feed my sheep. Then feed my lambs. Take care and disciple each other. If we truly love Christ, and this is what we need to ask ourselves today, do we really truly love Christ? If you do, then what are you doing for him? What are you doing to nourish others? What are you doing to fish for others, for unbelievers, and then nurture the believers and nourish them? You see, the church of Christ, I'm going to end with this. The church of Christ, the one that he intended for it to be, has become twisted tainted and tarnished. Not all of them. But if you look at the ones that rise to the surface, the popular ones, the ones that you see on social media and that have all the conferences, a lot of times they've become twisted. They've become tainted and tarnished. And it's because the enemy has come in and spun this web of deceit. And many have become caught within it where he's convinced them that church is more about themselves and their success and their popularity rather than about Christ. See, the Lord's church, the Lord's church has been reduced. This grieves me to a powerless, unanointed, godless shell of worldly entertainment and social status where sin runs rampant and lies and compromises are passed off as truth. I'm, I'm grieved. If I'm grieved, I know the Lord is grieved. I know what church was like when I first gave my life to Christ. I know the power that was in it. I know the presence of God that was there. The prayer meetings we had, the times where we would linger at the service, I mean, at the altar, and the Lord would show up, and he would do signs and wonders and miracles, and people would shout and run the aisles. We didn't have chandeliers, so you couldn't swing from them. <laughs> but I know what the churches were like, and I've watched it dwindle and get compromised. And I've watched sin enter in. All because many don't know the truth. They either haven't been taught or they don't want to be taught. And the sad part is we, the pastors, will be held responsible for some things. We're going to be held responsible for that kind of church. But here's the thing, you, the believer, will also be held responsible. You're going to be held responsible for whether or not you've been a fisherman or a fisherwoman and what you did with them after you caught them. You see, I want this church to be different, and I believe this church is different. I know we have something unique and special here. We shouldn't be unique and special. All churches should be this way. But I've been in enough that I know that what we have 
is something special and unique because I refuse to compromise. You refuse to compromise. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus, always about Jesus. I want this church to be one that the Lord would be proud of, one that Jesus can present to his Father as a holy, spotless bride. So as we close this morning, I'm not even having the worship team come back up. I told them I'm going to give them a break this morning. But I want us to really reevaluate. This is what I keep saying, and that's what this whole year has been about, Looking at our own hearts, at our own lives, are we growing in the Lord? Are we truly committed to the Lord? Are we evangelizing others? Are we discipling others? If you answer no to any of those, then what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Yes, I'm the pastor, but I'm here to equip the saints, right? I'm here to equip you. The Holy Spirit empowers you to do it. I can't do any of it for you. You have to do it for yourself. You've got to answer the question for yourself. Am I really, truly committed to him? Don't let fear sidetrack you. Don't let doubt sidetrack you. God's got a purpose and a plan for you. And once we're all in, this place will explode. (laughs) We'll burst from the inside out because we can't keep it contained inside of us. 